Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Martha Scott and William Gargan in Cheers for Miss Bishop. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. One of the keystones of democracy is the magic formula that pursues American youth from the first grade to a college degree, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And somewhere in the memory of most of us, there's a deep appreciation of some great and humble teacher who we used to think made life miserable for us. So tonight we turn back the years and remember. Cheers for Miss Bishop. It's a warmly human story of one such woman, a teacher in a, in a small American college. And we bring it to you with Martha Scott and William Gargan in the original, the original stars of Richard Rowland's fine motion picture just released by United Artists. You know, when we raise the curtain on one of these Monday night plays, we're presenting the finished product of a good deal of hard work and experiment. The kind of work it takes to get the best out of the best materials. Of course, that's a tradition in any theater, and particularly in this one, because the little package behind it, Lux Toilet Soap, has the same kind of background. No finished product is any better than the amount of work and care that goes into it, and that's one thing that makes Lux Toilet Soap a name which stands for the best in millions of American homes. And we have that very much in mind when we raise the curtain and say, Lux presents. Tonight it presents an exquisite love story. But Cheers for Miss Bishop is more than that. It's a drama of the unsung heroine, the kind you'll find in your hometown and every town, a woman who has given the full measure of devotion to an ideal of service. It's a story that's very close to my heart because both my mother and father were school teachers at one time, and if it weren't rather a selfish thing to do, I'd, I'd like to dedicate our production to them. But a good many other people have some well-loved and long-remembered teacher in mind, too. So we let each listener silently make his own dedication as we raise the curtain on Act One of Cheers for Miss Bishop, starring Martha Scott as Ella Bishop and William Gargan as Sam Peters, with Mary Anderson as Amy. On a windswept plain somewhere west of the Mississippi River stand the ivy-covered walls of a small university. For more than half a century, it has weathered the storms of the prairie land, and now it's growing old with dignity and grace. In a little house just off the grounds, a white-haired woman sits at the window, looking out across the campus. She is Ella Bishop, senior member of the faculty. In almost 50 years of service, she has grown old, Ooh. Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. Oh, good evening, Sam. I didn't hear you come in. I knocked three times. Nobody else home? No, nope, all alone. Sit down, Sam. You're all I wanted to see. Just thought I'd stop in for a second on my way home by way of an innovation. <laughs> <laughs> Tired, Elle? No, I've just been sitting here looking backward. Great waste of time. What happened at the trustees' meeting yesterday? I wasn't there. I had to go over to Pretty Prairie to see about some land I'm buying. More land? You must own half the state already. <laughs> and all from one little grocery store. <laughs> You've been a great success, Sam. So have you, Elle. Me? <laughs> I'm just an old maid school teacher with a lot of wonderful memories. Remember the day you drove up to the house in your brand new delivery wagon? Do you realize that's over 50 years ago? 50 years. I must have been 22. Mm -hmm. I was 17. It was the day Midwestern opened. September 1888. There was only one building then, Central Hall. and I remember how thrilled I was to be a student at a real university. President Corcoran made the opening address in the auditorium. I'll never forget what he said that day. 
I know that some of you have walked miles to get here, and that every day for four years you'll have to walk those miles through rain and sleet and snow. But I know this, the end will pay you for those hardships because the end is wisdom. Wisdom is first cousin to freedom, and freedom is the glory of our nation and of our people. cousin to freedom, and freedom is the glory of our nation and our people. Oh, doesn't that give you a thrill, Muzz? Yes, Ella. Drink your milk. You've had nothing since breakfast. Of course, it was the way he said it, so simply. Oh, he has the most wonderful voice and the most wonderful eyes. Is he married, Ella? Who, Amy? President Corcoran. Oh, Amy. <laughs> Muzz, what are we going to do with this romantic-minded niece of yours? Well, <laughs> goodness, I didn't say anything. I just asked if he were married. <laughs> Did you finish shelling those peas, Amy? I'm doing it. Sometimes I think Amy is a little boy crazy. <laughs> no, she isn't, Muzz. Just 14. <laughs> Miss Bishop! Oh, there's Sam <gasps> Peters. Sam! He's got a new delivery wagon. Look! I want to tell him about college. Oh, Sam! Sam! Oh, boy, whoa! Hello, Ellen. Oh, Sam, wait till I tell you. You don't have to. Oh, more Bishop. Yes? The apples didn't get in today. Have them here the first thing in the morning. Early, please, Sam. Applesauce and pies. First delivery. Cross my heart, Ma Bishop. All right, Sam. Your orders are my <laughs> Faithful old dog, Trey. How are you, Al? I'm not too pleased with faithful old dog, Trey, at the moment. You didn't come to hear about my first day at college. You just came about some old apples. Uh-uh. New apples. September sweetings. Oh, what a nice name. <laughs> What a nice world, Sam. And you perched right on top of it, huh? Mm, the very tip top. Are you sure you don't want to enroll? It isn't too late. Look, Al, see the name on that cart? Sam Peters. Oh, I know it. Something of your very own. Something you started. Not just my own, Al. It's... Well, good glory, I know book learning isn't everything, but just you wait. I'll wait. And the day you graduate, You can I'm... help me decide which of the millions of teaching offers I'll accept. Like heck I will. You know, for a smart girl, you sure have some mighty pudding head notions, Elle. Imagine figuring that you're cut out for a teacher. But good glory, Sam, you don't think I'm going to spend all my life teaching, do you? Oh, oh, that's all right, then. I've got scads of time. But, but someday, Elle, I... Sam, dear, you mustn't. I mean, don't you see, I, I just know you too well and... Well, stop. What? Stop. Stop answering questions till they're asked. You know, some girls take an awful lot for granted... Remember the day you graduated? You were mighty proud, Al. Mm, but all those teaching offers I expected <laughs> didn't even get one. I never could understand that. <laughs> Neither could I. That's why I went to see President Corcoran. That's right. I drove you over in the wagon. So I thought that if you knew of an opening in any of the schools around here, I mean, just the prairie grade schools, well... Do you, President Corcoran? Well, I'm pretty busy with the fall enrollments, Miss Bishop, and I'm trying to arrange for a new member of the faculty, a young woman to teach freshman English, a girl I've watched pretty closely for four years, an intelligent girl, I think. Anyway, she seems to me to have one quality which is mighty important to the teaching profession. She loves and understands folks. President Corcoran, do you... Of course, I know you couldn't mean... I can't help thinking you might mean President Corcoran, do you mean... Oh, dear, dear, dear. There's a heap of repetition in that sentence for a teacher of freshman English. Oh, President Corcoran. <laughs> <laughs> you were pretty scared the first day school opened. <laughs> Wasn't I, though? I stood alone in that empty classroom, looking at the rows of seats, and my heart was heavy as lead. For an hour before the students came, I rehearsed my opening speech. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, good morning, class. I, I want you please to devote the first ten minutes to the writing of a very brief theme on the subject of my favorite season. Oh, no, no, I'll have them write on some subject that will teach me something about them. Their life ambition, that's it. I've got to understand them if I'm going to help them to learn anything. Oh, good glory. Good morning. Hasn't the teacher come yet? 
Uh, good morning. I'm... You know, I wonder what she's like. Most of them are a lot of old hags. Young man, I'm the teacher. Oh. Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But don't be worried. I... I'm just as frightened as you are. <laughs> Come to order, please. Uh, Mr. Anton Radchek, will you read your theme, please? Yes, ma'am. My life's ambition is to be a great astronomer because ever since I can remember, the stars to me have been comfort and beauty and like friends. Thank you, Mr. Radchek. Uh, Miss Minna Field. Miss Minna Field. Well, except to get learning, I ain't got no special life's ambition yet. <laughs> Quiet, please. Quiet. Miss Field, Mr. Radchek, I'd like both of you to come to my office, please, after class. <laughs> Professor Wick studied astronomy at Yale, Mr. Radchek, and both he and President Corcoran have agreed that if there's a student at Midwestern who wants a course in astronomy, he shall have a course in astronomy. Oh, Miss Bishop. Report to Professor Wick in the morning. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, I tripped. <laughs> So it just occurred to me, Minna, that you might be interested in the librarian's course. It would be an interesting job, wouldn't it, Minna? Oh, yes, Miss Bishop. But, Miss Bishop... Yes, Minna? I, I have got a life's ambition now, Miss Bishop. It's, it's to be just like you. Oh, it was wonderful, that first year of teaching. I'd never been so happy in my life. And then, then there was the night of the Glee Club concert. You couldn't go with me. No, I had a cold. You were very nice about it, Sam. I've often wondered, Al. Well, was that the first time you met Del Thompson? Mm, funny the way it happened. I'd made some maple snow candy and put it on the window to cool. It slid down off the sill and I went out on the roof to get it. Of course, the window closed behind me, and it would. <laughs> and there I was, trapped on the roof. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo who, me? Uh, Yoo-hoo anybody! I'm locked out here on the roof, and there's no one to let me in. Coming! Uh, there's a ladder right over there by the wall. I've got it. Shall I come up a la fire brigade? Oh, no, thank you. I'll come down a la rescued maiden. Are you sure you can make it? Oh, positive. Oh. What's the matter? I, I lost my slipper. Where? Oh, here it is. Thank you. May I have it, please? Oh, no. What? You mustn't draw in the most time-honored romantic scene in all the world of fairy tales. Extend your tiny foot, Cinderella. I'll put your slipper on. Well, funnily enough, my name is Ella. I'm Ella Bishop. And I'm the prince. And the slipper fits. So now it only remains for me to carry you into the palace. Oh, please don't be absurd. Don't you be absurd. Oh, no, please. You can't go plowing through snow and glass slippers. Oh. You'd catch your death of pneumonia, and then you couldn't live happily ever after. I want to be put down here, please. Oh, 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 no, no, not on a snow-covered porch. I'll have to carry you inside. Oh, please, you Say, must... I just thought, carrying a young lady across the threshold, there's an old legend about that, isn't there? Well, really. Put me down this minute, please. Right in front of the fire. There. When I save lives, I save them thoroughly. Thank you very much, Mr. Delbert Thompson. Well, you're not Cinderella at all. You're a witch with the gift of second sight. <laughs> no, I'm just a schoolteacher of average intelligence who lives in a small town where everybody knows everybody's business. Oh, we all know, for instance, that you are a brilliant young lawyer, that you're coming to live with Judge Peters, that you're to be his junior partner, and uh, underneath your picture in your class book it said... Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Well, then, shouldn't you, in kindness, ask the junior partner to sit down? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't. My mother's at a concert tonight. And we must observe the conventions at all costs. At all costs. Well, I'm glad to have been of service, Miss Bishop. Thank you so much, Mr. Thompson. And I'll pay my respects to your mother real soon. She'll be delighted. Maybe I ought to stay till she gets home. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I tried. No harm done, huh? 
No harm. Good night. Good night, Princess. Mad, bad, and dangerous? No. <laughs> Hmm? What's that, Amy? You're supposed to be dancing with me, not looking around for Ella. <laughs> Is your nose a little out of joint, Sam? You mean about Del Thompson rushing Elle? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, Amy, honey. I'm not jealous. Well, judging from the way he's been swarming around, he sure must be crazy about her. Who isn't? There they are now. He's awfully good-looking, isn't he? <laughs> Why, Amy, you seem more interested even than Elle does. Well, maybe I am. And she seems pretty interested to me. <laughs> do you, Ella, Ella Bishop, take this man for your lawful wedded husband? <laughs> of course I do, you fool. And do you, Delbert Thompson, take this woman for your lawful wedded wife? I do. I now pronounce you man and wife. Now, may I kiss the bride? Please do, Del. Oh, Ella, it's like a dream. It's the end of all dreaming. A little house all your own, a warm fire in the hearth. The man you love and children. Well, we were to be married in June, as soon as school closed. I'd been working on my wedding dress for weeks. It was beautiful. One night, Amy was alone downstairs when Dell was to call. I found out later that she was trying on my veil with her back to the door. That's how Dell came to mistake her for me. The most beautiful bride in the world. Dell. Why, Amy. A Amy, I thought... Uh... Don't talk. Kiss me, Dell. Amy, we're crazy. I mean, what a crazy mistake. Yes. Yes, of course. Amy, do you have my veil? Oh, hello, Dell. Amy, put it in the spare room, please, with the dress. All right. Oh, Dell, you shouldn't have seen the veil. I hope it isn't bad luck. How could it be bad luck? Oh, I didn't mean that seriously. But you aren't supposed to see the wedding finery before the wedding day. Ella, why can't this be the wedding day? Darling. We can keep it a secret till college is over if we have to. But, Del... Why not? We can drive to Maple City. We can be married tonight. Darling, I have to go to Central Hall tonight, a special meeting. Ella, listen. I can't, dear. There's a girl who's been accused of cheating in an examination. I know she didn't cheat, and I'm the only one who can help her. I can't desert her, Dale. All right, Ella. Will you drive me over? Certainly. Oh, Ella. Yes? I'm going to have a game of cribbage with Judge Peters. Could you two drop me? Dell will. You can let me off first. What a night. Isn't the moon beautiful? I thought you were going out on the river with Larry Winslow. Larry, no. I'm sick of wasting my time on those children. <laughs> right here, Del, please. I'll wait for you, Ella. No, don't. I'll be very late. Good night, dear. Good night. Give my love to Judge Peters, Amy. Del, it's too beautiful a night for cribbage. Shall I take you home? Oh, no, please. It would be... Heavenly down by the river. Could we drive down there or... Or what? Or are you afraid? Get up. I had a note from Dell the next day. Came to me in class. He said that something terrible had happened. That he must see me alone. I, I was frantic. I rushed back to the house to wait for him. Del. Oh, Del, what is it? Tell me nothing's happened. Something terrible you said. Tell me, Del. Tell me nothing's happened. It is terrible, Ella. It's about... Ella, I'd give my right arm to spare you this. You must believe that. Just what is it you want me to believe? Are you trying to make it difficult, Ella? If you won't tell her, I will. Yes. I'm sure Amy will supply all the lovely details. Amy, it was all your fault anyway, Ella. If you hadn't left him for a stupid board meeting, it 
It's not like I'd taken anything you really cared a lot about. Amy. Oh, I know what you're thinking. But it isn't so. I didn't plan anything. It just happened. Oh, Cromniel, you needn't look at me that way. I didn't mean to do anything. Besides, it doesn't give you any license to treat me like dirt. That's what you're doing. You're treating me like dirt. I'm going to my room. No, you've got to listen to me. It was an accident, I tell you. You left him alone. You didn't care. But now he's mine. Do you understand? You can't marry him. He's mine. Oh, Emma. <laughs> Ella, open the door. Ella, what are you doing in there? Answer me, Ella. What a night. Isn't the moon beautiful? Why can't this be our wedding day? Ella, I'm your mother. Let me in. Isn't the moon beautiful? We can drive to Maple City. You left him alone. You didn't care. We'll be married tonight. And now he's mine. Ella. Ella. Tonight. He's mine. Ella. He's mine. mine. Ella, what are you doing? Ella. Mother, please don't worry. I'm all right now. <laughs> in just a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Martha Scott and William Gargan, will return in Act Two of Cheers for Miss Bishop. You know, there's a game that we men like to think is a game played exclusively by the ladies. It's called conversational bridge. So just for a minute, let's listen in on a round of this fascinating game being played at Mrs. Johnson's home. Don't turn round now, but is that May Saunders at the next table? Didn't she used to live next door to the Johnsons years ago? Yes, she just moved back to town. Looks wonderful, doesn't she? So young. Goodness, wonder how she does it. I'll say one thing. She certainly has lovely skin. Hurry, girls. They're waiting for us to finish this home. Well, our bridge players might be surprised to learn how very simple Mrs. Saunders' beauty care really is. She just follows the same easy routine that thousands of pretty women all over the USA are finding so effective. Ask her about it, and she'd tell you. Here, every night I take a Lux Soap Active Lather Facial and often take one as a quick beauty pickup during the day, too. I find Lux Toilet Soap has wonderful active lather that removes dust, dirt, and stale cosmetics thoroughly. Leaves my skin looking beautifully fresh. Here's what I do. I pat the rich lather lightly in, rinse with warm water, then with cool, and pat dry with a soft towel. These Lux Soap facials really work. Women who've tried Lux Soap facials say they're delighted with the way they leave skin feeling smooth, soft. Why don't you use this gentle care regularly for 30 days? Remember this important fact. Lux Toilet Soap is the beauty soap used by nine out of ten screen stars, the world's loveliest women. That's proof positive it's as fine, as gentle a soap as money can buy. Get three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Cheers for Miss Bishop, starring Martha Scott as Ella Bishop and William Gargan as Sam Peters, with Mary Anderson as Amy. In a little house near Midwestern campus, the two old friends, Ella Bishop and Sam Peters, are talking quietly. The room is filled with memories, some gay, some sad. Memories of a day when Sam and Ella were young. We were to be married in June, and it was June when Del Thompson took Amy away as his wife. I wanted to run away, too, to run away and hide and never have to speak to another soul. I sent my resignation to President Corcoran. And he came to the house that afternoon. I just received your letter, Ella. Well, I, I thought it easier to write, you see. Mother and I are going to New York, President Corcoran. It's a, uh, an assistant librarian's position. I see. Well, of course, it is a hard job, teaching. It never pays much. I know. And lots of the time, it's a headache, wondering if it's worthwhile. Why, President Corcoran, you can't feel that way. You're inspired. I mean, 
You give young people courage and confidence ideals. Oh, I'm trying. You see, Ella, I heard Abe Lincoln talk at Gettysburg, and he talks sense. You know, we've got something wonderful here in this country, the idea of people being free. But it's got to be taught and retaught to each new crop of youngsters the value of freedom. Ella, your father homesteaded on this prairie. Remember what his first corn looked like? Yes, it was small and green. He couldn't believe it would ever grow. That's it. And human beings are harder to raise than corn. But when they're raised, if they're raised right, they're worth a lot more per bushel, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly didn't intend to deliver a lecture. Of course, we must accept your resignation. But are you sure your New York library needs you as much as our own seed corn here in Midwestern? President Corcoran, may I have that letter? I've changed my mind. <laughs> Ride home for me. Get in quickly, Elle. Sam, what is it? It isn't Bob. No, but I'm afraid it's going to be a shock. Amy's back. Amy? She's going to have a baby. Did she come back alone? Yes, she's alone. Oh, I don't want a baby. Oh, well, I, I... I'm frightened, Ella. There's nothing to be frightened about, Amy. He just left. He just went away and... He didn't come back. Oh, he didn't know I was going to have a baby. I was going to tell you him. You should have told him, Amy. Oh, he didn't love me. He never loved anybody but you. Shh. The doctor says you need rest. You will be kind to me, won't you, Ella? You're all I've got in the world. This is your home, Amy. Go to sleep now. <laughs> oh, Ella. Ella. Shh. Don't, Amy. Sleep. What on earth are you doing, Sam? I'm stirring the water. Well, it won't boil any quicker for that. Just leave it alone. Ella, why does it have to, uh, you know, does it always take this long? Oh, no. I... Well, then what's the matter? Uh, there isn't anything wrong, is there? Sam, please, I'm very busy. Give me that small kettle. I've got to go up. Listen. Mother. Mother, is she all right? Mother. She's gone. You couldn't save her. Poor Amy. Poor little Amy. Miss Ella, you like to see the baby? She fine, healthy girl. Oh, a girl. May I hold her, please? Sure, Miss Ella. There. Holding a baby comes natural to you, Miss Ella. I'm going to keep her. I'm going to call her Hope. Hope. <laughs> Fine baby, wasn't she? Mm, she was lovely, and as I watched her year by year growing into a lovely young woman, I was proud. Do you remember, Sam, when she first entered Midwestern? About 1900, wasn't it? Mm. I remember. Her first day in school, she ran over you with a bicycle. Oh, <laughs> no, Sam, that wasn't Hope. It was a girl in a class. Oh, and I've been accusing Hope of it for years. I was coming along the walk in front of Old Central, and the next thing you know, I was lying in a flower bed. Look out! Oh. Oh. Anybody hurt here? No, but I'm mad as a had Oh, gee, I'm sorry. Come here, girl. You're an entering freshman, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. Then don't you know that entering freshmen are not allowed to ride their bicycles on the campus? Well, yes, ma'am, but I thought... You that... mean you should have thought. A pretty mark against you before you even get into college. That is, if I were going to take the time and trouble to report you. Oh, oh gee, thank you, ma'am. I'm terribly sorry. Well, sorry myself. Shouldn't have lost my temper. Come and see me when you get homesick. Central Hall, Ella Bishop. Now scat and wheel that bike. Oh, yes, I will. Thank you, Miss Bishop. Goodbye. Goodbye. You're sure you're all right? Huh? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Well, then, perhaps I could come to your office, too, Miss Bishop. Huh? I have messages for you from three of your former pupils. They took extension work under me at Columbia. Why, you must be John Stevens. Who has been looking forward so much to meeting Ella Bishop. Well, Professor Stevens, <laughs> I, we're so excited about having you join our staff. I, I'd planned a very elegant reception, a little welcoming tea in my office. Very dignified. Well, it's just tea time now, isn't it? Come along. <laughs> Come yet? 
No, your young sophomore is late as usual, Hope. And what about your bow? Hope you really must. Oh, you don't have to worry, Aunt Ella. When the kids at college ask me if it's a romance between you and Johnny Stevens... Please, I... Hope. Oh, do you object to me calling him Johnny? I think he's terribly attractive. Don't you, Aunt Ella? Hope, if you've any idiotic notions about Professor Stevens and me... Hello, folks. Any customers for a sleigh ride? Oh, good evening, Sam. The roads are slick and the moon is bright. And you're out of luck, Uncle Sam. I'm going skating with Richard, and Aunt Ella's expecting... Hope is expecting Professor Stevens uh, for an academic evening. Good night, folks. Good night, night. Hope. Is Stevens coming, Ella? Yes, bringing a new book. Won't you stay and listen, Sam? You could do with a little brushing up. I don't know why I've never had more feeling for books. Wish I had. Don't wish it. I wouldn't change you for the world. You wouldn't marry me either. But you may yet, unless this fellow Stevens... Sam, I want you to help me. I must tell you something. What is it, Al? Professor Stevens has a wife. A wife? She's in Virginia. They haven't seen each other for some time. Oh, well, uh, why doesn't he get a divorce? Oh, Sam, how wonderful to find someone in Oak River who doesn't shudder at the word. Al, if it's for your happiness... Thank you, Sam. Excuse me. Good evening, John. Good evening, Ella. Sorry I'm a little late. Oh, that's all right. Good evening, Professor. Hello, Sam. I've been trying to persuade Sam to stay and meet your new friend, uh, Mr. Barry, isn't it? <laughs> yes, the little minister. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid it's out of my class. Now, if it were Frank Merriwell... <laughs> oh, <laughs> Good night, Al. Good night. Good night. Good night, Sam. Shall I read some more, Ella? Please do. The meeting had only one witness, a weaver. And he said solemnly afterward... They did not speak, but they just gave one another a look, and I saw the love light in their een. That's beautiful, isn't it? The life of every man is a diary in which he means to write one story and writes another. Would you mind reading that again? Just the last sentence. The life of every man is a diary in which he means to write one story and writes another. Suppose that's true, isn't it? We dream so many beautiful things, but... Most of them never happen, do they? Just look at me, John. <laughs> Playing hooky in Maple City for a clandestine dinner, and we'd both be dismissed if they found us out. And I love it, don't you? More than I can say. But I have to ruin it, Ella. I had a letter today from my wife. I want to read you just one paragraph. Oh, no, John, not tonight. It has to be tonight. Listen. John, I know I was never the right wife for you, but I can never consent to a divorce. You must know what it would mean to my family. I am sorry. I can understand. But what about us? Yes, what? Scusate me, signore. Special wine for the lady. Oh, Orvieto. Thank you, Seiko. Orvieto, I should know, but I don't. It's a little Italian town, Orvieto. It's sunny and warm. It's planted in warm sunlight. I remember once seeing a beggar there with a beautiful flower in a ragged hat. He was perfectly happy. A beggar with a flower in his ragged hat. And sunlight. I stayed there for weeks and weeks. I ate chestnut bread with the peasants and drank the new wine. And I was perfectly happy. Ella... Why can't you sail for Europe in June? Why can't I join you there? Europe with you? I could sail first and join you in Italy. Will you, Ella? Will you? John. A special flower for the lady. Oh, thank you, Jekyll. John, will you take me home now? had three wonderful hours in Orvieto. There are some people who never go. Oh, there's no time in Orvieto. Why can't we stay? Oh, my darling, is it asking too much? Too much. Or too little, I don't know. I only know that I would stay oh so gladly, John, if I could follow my heart. 
But you and I, being as we are, there'd be tomorrow. And sometime we'll be glad we spent just this little time in Oviedo. Goodbye, John. Your flowers, you're forgetting them. Oh, thank you. Flowers for the lady. The wonderful lady. It's been perfect. All of it. Haven't you forgotten something, too? Forgotten something? A kiss. A special kiss for the lady. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, my darling. Oh, the Eto. Though you're a teacher, you set yourself up to carry a beacon for boys and girls to see by. Well, carry it. Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille will present Martha Scott and William Gargan in Act Three of Cheers for Miss Bishop. Now I'm going to see if Sally here knows her ABCs. What did you say, Mr. Roy? <laughs> well, I want to see if you know your ABCs, Sally. Let's start with A. What does A stand for? A? A. Oh, I see what you're leading up to. A stands for active lather, of course. Lux Soap's active lather. Right. Now, how about B? What does that stand for? Mm. Oh, I know. Beauty bath. B stands for the wonderful beauty bath Lux Toilet Soap makes. Good for you. Now, how about C? <laughs> That's easy. C stands for Lux Soap's costly perfume. Say, you get an A plus and a gold star tonight, Sally. Now, if you can tell us just why those ABCs are so important, you can go to the head of the class. <laughs> That's easy. Lux Toilet Soap's active lather is important because it does such a thorough job, yet it's gentle as a summer breeze. That's one reason why active lather facials are such a wonderful beauty aid. They remove stale cosmetics, every trace of dust and dirt, and leave your skin feeling soft and smooth and help you keep it that way. We might add, Sally, that famous Hollywood screen stars like Irene Dunn and Claudette Colbert say they never neglect their daily Lux Soap beauty care because it helps them keep their skin as beautiful to look at as Hollywood's million-dollar complexions have to be. But I hadn't finished about those ABCs, Mr. Ruick. I was going to say that a daily Lux Soap beauty bath is important because it protects daintiness. It makes a girl sure of skin that's sweet. As for C, Lux Toilet Soap's costly perfume, why, it's made of 34 different ingredients, all combined and blended to give an exclusive flower-like fragrance, a fragrance that clings. And, of course, if you want to go to the M's, now M stands for Lux Soap's mildness, and then... Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, Sally. But the things you've said certainly add up to one important fact. Lux Toilet Soap is a quality product. It's as fine a soap as money can buy, yet it costs only a few cents a cake. So this soap that nine out of ten lovely screen stars use is a luxury every woman can enjoy. I hope if any of you ladies in our audience happen to supply on hand, you'll make a note like this now. Tomorrow, three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap to help me keep skin beautiful and to make me sure of skin that's sweet. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of Cheers for Miss Bishop. With the gathering dusk, the present has vanished into the shadows of the room, and the past emerges clear and vivid, in the memory of Ella Bishop. Hope was just 18 when she became engaged to Richard Clark. She told me one day about a wedding dress that her friend had worn, her mother's. That same evening, I brought Hope up to my room and gave her my dress and the bridal veil that I had never worn. Oh, and Ella's the 
loveliest thing I've ever seen. Oh, you could have it made over any way you like. There are yards of material. Oh, I wouldn't have it changed for worlds. But well, it was never finished. No, it was never finished. Oh, Aunt Ella. Aunt Ella, darling, I, I never thought that... Was it for you? Yes. I know I shouldn't ask, but... Well, well you know, I, I always thought that you and Professor Stevens... Were... Made in that fashion. No, dear. No, of course not. But he did resign so suddenly last year, and so many people thought... So that... many people have so many wildly romantic thoughts, my dear. But do you like the dress? Oh, I couldn't have dreamed a dress I'd rather be married in. Unless... Well, well, you're not old, Aunt Ella, not really old. Are you sure you won't... Well, well Yes, I'm... darling, I'm very sure. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm new here. Is this where you register? No, uh, that building over there. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, uh, do I have to pay my entrance fee first? No, any time this month. All you have to do in there is to sign your name or uh, make a cross. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I ain't got no money till next week. To get me a college education, my pappy's selling two of the finest pair of Jenny mules in the whole state of North Carolina. Let her shine. <laughs> I sort of suspected you were from the South. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What's your name? John McCree, but you can just call me Snapper. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm Ella Bishop. I teach freshman English, and you could do with a little Snapper. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I reckon I could. Ella. Ella Bishop. President Corcoran. You're looking bonny, Ella. Did you have a good summer? Good enough. How's everything with you? Was Scotland just as beautiful as you remembered it? Just as I remembered it, even to the misty, moisty weather. And Brussels, the exposition. Well, I had rather sad news in Brussels, Ella. Oh? Yes, I'd arranged to see John Stevens there. You remember Stevens. Well, just before we were to meet, I heard that he was killed in a train wreck in Italy. Italy? Yes. Ella, what is it? What? Ella, I never knew. No one knew. You've changed a lot in the next few years, Ella. Yes, I grew bitter and old. In 1908, President Corcoran resigned and President Watts took his place. I seemed to feel all my friends slipping away from me. I didn't like President Watts, and I thought he didn't like me. President of this university, I must insist that every member of the faculty carry out my ideas. I demanded certain changes in the curriculum. And I've made them, President Watts. But you haven't made them interesting to your students. You're calling me a bad teacher. Now look here, President Watts. If you're asking me to resign... I'm not. I know from your past record how valuable you could be. But the college right now is at a turning point. It can go ahead or it can slump to nothing. It, it can't remain as it is. A, a hobbled ahoy and father's cast off clothes. President Watts, I won't listen to you anymore. A oh, hobbledyhoy. I'm sorry, that's all you heard. After 25 years of teaching, you dare tell me I'm a bad teacher. Well, Oh, I... you can go ahead and ruin Midwestern, but you're not going to humiliate me. A oh, hobbledyhoy and father's cast off clothes. That's what you said. Well, if this college was good enough for President Corcoran, it's plenty good enough for you, Mr. Watts. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Miss. Ella. Oh, President Corcoran. President Emeritus. Or is it Emeritus? <laughs> I was al always going to look it up. Uh, sit down, Ella, dear. Sit down. I've been meaning to come and see you. Oh, I should have come to see you. Now that I've retired, you're the busy one. I... Oh, President Corcoran. Why, Ella, bless you. What's wrong, my dear? Oh, that man, what? Oh, so that's it. Do you know what he said about our college? What? He called it a hobbledehoy in father's cast-off clothes. He did, eh? Yeah. A hobbledehoy in father's cast-off clothes. Mm. <laughs> well, well, that's pretty good, Ella. Sir Corcoran. He's right, my dear. You see, you and I, we knew the first of it. So naturally, it looks big to us now. It is big. It's magnificent compared to what we started with. But we are too close to it, Ella. Now, Watts has come in with a fresh viewpoint. Fresh is the word. All his talk about modern methods. Uh, they're what Midwestern needs, Ella. Well, even you, my dear, could do with a bit of modernizing. Huh? Oh, no, no, I, I, I'm not criticizing, my dear. Oh, no, no, no. 
I know that you've got a heart and mind and spirit as potentially young as spring itself. President Corcoran, what you don't know about handling people. Yeah. Me, an old maid, young as spring, mm -hmm. and me loving it. And loving Midwestern, too, eh? I do love Midwestern. Then stay and help our driving friend. What is a driver, Ella? You see, that's why I picked him. The passing of President Corcoran was a great shock. He died as he'd lived, quietly, beloved by everyone who knew him. Then the following year, I lost Mother. Hope and Richard were living in California, and you were the only one I could turn to, Sam. <laughs> Faithful old dog, Trey. Mm. Hope's daughter was born in 1924. It's hard to believe that she's a young lady now, old enough to be a sophomore at Midwestern. Hello, baby. How are you? Oh, hello, Gretchen. Aren't you surprised to see your favorite grandniece? I haven't bothered you in ages. I'm not surprised at anything these days. What's on your mind, my pet? Oh, love. Hmm? What a novelty. This is. It's, it's a man I met in Chicago. He's quite a well-known explorer, but... Aunt Ella, he's married. I see. Can't he get a divorce? No. His wife won't agree to it. Oh, it wouldn't be an open scandal. I could go along as a member of the expedition, secretary or something. Oh, Aunt Ella, you can't know. I could sail first and meet you in Italy. I think I can understand. Yes, almost anything but this. You've been content to stay in one spot. But I've got such a yen to go places. Magic carpet places, rich, warm, exciting. It's a little town in Italy, Orvieto. Sunny and warm, flooded with warm sunlight. Aunt Ella, you're not listening. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, I am. It must be your own decision, dear. And there's one thing you must consider. The most important thing of all. Reputation? No. You'd be cutting yourself off from motherhood. That's what's stopping me. I think that any woman who's half a woman would... Oh... Oh, forgive me, Aunt Ella. And besides, you had Mother to bring up. Yes, darling, I had your mother. I remember the first time I held her in my arms. She was practically brand new, and she was crying, and I was terrified to pick her up, but I did. She stopped crying and began making little contented peeping noises like a chicken. That was so satisfying. And the feel of her was, too. That warm little body against mine, but... But it... It wasn't the same. Couldn't be, could it? Flesh of my flesh. Those are thrilling words, Gretchen. You're right, of course. I can't go with him. <laughs> One slightly used magic carpet for sale. Cheap. Thanks, great aunt. Don't mention it, grandniece. Any time. Go again. How long have I been talking, Sam? Oh, a couple of hours. Living in the past again. I will not live in the past. As you sherry, Sam, we'll drink to the future. The future. Well, I'll be getting along, Al. No, sit down, Sam. I can't. If I did, I probably couldn't get up. And besides, I'm expecting three more old bachelors for dinner and bridge. Old bachelor. Doesn't that give you a twinge of conscience? Oh, Sam... <laughs> Well, anyway, if you feel like a hand later... I might at that. Well, if you do, just... Just, just holler, Sam. Sam. I will. <laughs> oh, I, I met President Crowder on my way over. He asked me if I'd give you this note. Oh, thank you, Sam. Night, Elle. Good night. My dear Miss Bishop, I would greatly appreciate your calling on me tomorrow at your convenience, sir. The recent meeting of the Board of Trustees... A resolution was passed recommending the retirement of faculty members of a certain age. Retirement. Aunt Ella? Aunt Ella, are you ready? 
No, I'm not. Hello, Gretchen. Aunt Ella, you haven't even started to dress. I'm not going. Aunt Ella. It's the last dinner in Old Central Hall. They're going to tear it down tomorrow. I'm sorry, dear. I just decided. After all, I've been to 51 alumni banquets. 51 times have I sat through an hour of bad food and three hours of bad speeches. It's no good, Toots. You're not fooling me one bit. Darling, I know how you must feel, sort of the, well, the If end you of... do know how I feel, you'll run along like a good child. Have a good time and leave me here with my, well, my New Yorker. I want to catch up on some Broadway plays. Now that I'm retired and a lady of leisure, I may get to New York yet. Sorry, Lampi, but you've got to come tonight. Gretchen, I've absolutely decided. And I've absolutely decided, too. You're coming to the dinner, so go on and get dressed. Hurry, Aunt Ella. Oh, hurry. Do you realize I'm over 70? I don't believe it. Where are the orchids I brought you? Let me stick them on. Oh, all right. Where's that pin? No, not at the waist, pet. On the shoulder. Much snappier. Mm. I must, above all things, be snappy. There's Sam waiting for us. Evening, Al. Oh, hello, Sam. They cornered you, too. Take my arm. We're going to make an entrance. Ready? Lead on. Sam. It's all for you, Elle. You're the guest of honor. Keep a stiff upper lip. Oh, Sam. And now, one of her first pupils, Anton Radcheck. Astronomer Extraordinary, winner of the Nobel Prize, Mr. Radchek. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure that Miss Bishop will remember the day when I, a simple farm boy, said to her, my life's ambition is to be a great astronomer. Or if she doesn't remember, I could manage to trip over another chair. <laughs> Now, John McCrae, United States Senator. Miss Bishop probably doesn't remember Senator McCrae, but if you just call me Snapper, she might. But I'm sure she'll never forget the day that I announced English ain't what I come for. <laughs> Miss Menna Field, world famous historian. My ambition in life is still to be just like you, Miss Bishop. Miss Ella Bishop, for your irreplaceable gift of human sympathy and because you exemplify to all of us what the American spirit can be, your university bestows on you the highest degree in its power. that I've had a long life. I've seen the brave, the gallant, and the kind. They keep coming on, the best in this country. So now, when Old Central and I are retiring to make way for modern buildings and methods, it seems an appropriate time to quote the words of our great founder, words that inspired us when I was very, very young. Wisdom is the first cousin to freedom, and freedom is the glory of our nation and our people. So here's to our nation. She's young. She's growing too fast. She makes a lot of mistakes. But somehow she does manage to keep her people free. May she always. <laughs> Sam, take me home. Excitement tonight. A little too much for you, Al? Mm. 
You just rest now. Take it easy. <laughs> Good old dog, Trey. Always thinking of me. Sam, there's a question you've been wanting to ask for a well, long stop. time. Stop. Don't you go answering any questions till they're asked, see? I've got scads of time, Elle. All the time in the world. All the time in the world. Curtain falls on cheers for Miss Bishop. And at this moment, our cheers are for Martha Scott and Bill Gargan and the fine performances they gave tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mill. I'm happy to be back in this theater again. And the same goes for me, C.B. It must be a rather strange sensation to grow 50 years younger, Martha, in the twinkling of an eye from 70-some-odd <laughs> to 20-some-odd. 20 <laughs> 24 to be exact, Mr. DeMille, but that was the part I liked best, playing Ella Bishop when she was 70. I think I'll have a lot of fun when I'm that old, won't you, Bill? I'm looking forward to it, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm somewhat closer to it right now than either of you, and the prospect doesn't bother me one bit. You'll probably celebrate your 70th birthday, C.B., by directing a television scene with 2,000 extras, mostly Indians. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right smart idea, Bill. I'll put it on the calendar. You should work for C.B. in a picture sometime, Martha. He took me to a, on a trip to Hawaii to make four frightened people. <laughs> that sounds like a vacation, not work. What part did you play? I was one of the four frightened actors. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him fool you, Martha. He was a tower of strength. Well, he certainly was, and cheers for Miss Bishop. There's just one thing more I have to say, Mr. DeMille, and that's about Lux Soap. I think women everywhere are grateful for the help it gives them in caring for their complexions. I know I am. I've used it for several years, but I think a day or two would be enough to convince anyone just how good Lux Soap is. Well, there aren't many people left who need convincing on the subject of Lux Soap, Martha. But I'm confident we'll do it. What's on the boards for next week here, C.B.? A full hour of action, adventure, and romance, Bill. But we have a name for it. And the name is Flight Command. And we have three other excellent names, too. Robert Taylor... Walter Pidgeon and Ruth Hussey, the original stars of the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture. The plays a roaring drama of the United States Navy in the air, of the fighting men who wear the wings of the Navy, and of the women they love. I thought it was a thrilling picture, Mr. DeMille, and I'm looking forward to hearing it on the radio. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night. And let the rafters ring for your performances tonight. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Taylor, Walter Pigeon, and Ruth Hussey in Flight Command. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Martha Scott will soon be seen in the Columbia picture, They Dare Not Love. Heard in tonight's play were Griff Barnett as Corcoran, Fred Mackay as Dell, Fred Shields as John Stevens, Shirley Ward as Mrs. Bishop, Kathleen Fitz as Gretchen, Betty Jean Haney as Hope, Anne Tobin as Minna, Hans Conried as Radcheck, Lou Merrill as Watts, Bob Burleson as McRae, Earl Ross as Crowder, and Celeste Rush as Stenner. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.